Hello, I'm your host, Marcus Garrett. Every week I have entertaining conversations with your favorite influencers and entrepreneurs. Now, let's get started with this week's show. Why Millennials are facing the scariest financial future of any generation since the Great Depression by journalist Michael Hobbs. Like everyone in my generation, I am finding it increasingly difficult not to be scared about the future and angry about the past. I'm 35 years old the oldest millennial, the first millennial. And for a decade now, I've been waiting for adulthood to kick in. My rent consumes nearly half my income. I haven't had a steady job since Pluto was a planet and my savings are dwindling faster than the ice caps the baby boomers melted. We've all heard the statistics. More millennials live with their parents than with roommates. We are delaying marrying and house buying, kid having for longer than any previous generation. And according to the olds, our problems are all our fault. We got the wrong degree. We spend money we don't have on things we don't need. We still haven't learned to code. We killed cereal and department stores and golf and napkins and lunch. Mention millennial to anyone over 40 and the word entitlement will come back at you within seconds. Our own intergenerational game of Marco Polo. This is what it feels like to be young now. Not only are we screwed, but we have to listen to lectures about our laziness and our participation trophies from the people who screwed us. The generalizations about millennials, like those about any other arbitrarily defined group of 75 million people, fall apart under the slightest scrutiny. Contrary to the cliche, the vast majority of millennials did not go to college, do not work as baristas, and cannot lean on their parents for help. Every stereotype of our generation applies only to the tiniest, richest, whitest sliver of young people. And the circumstances we live in are more dire than most people realize. We've taken on at least 300,000% more student debt than our parents. We're about one half as likely to own a home as young adults were in 1975. One in five of us is living in poverty. Based on current trends, many of us won't be able to retire until we're 75. But it's not just the numbers. What is different about us as individuals compared to previous generations is minor. What is different about the world around us is profound. Salaries have stagnated and entire sectors have cratered. At the same time, the cost of every prerequisite of a secure existence, education, housing, and healthcare has inflated into the stratosphere. From job security to the social safety net, all the structures that insulate us from ruin are eroding and the opportunities leading to a middle-class life the ones that boomers lucked into are being lifted out of our reach add it all up and it's no surprise that we're the first generation in modern history to end up poorer than our parents this is why the touchstone experience of millennials the thing that truly defines us is not helicopter parenting or unpaid internships or pokemon go it is uncertainty. Some days I breathe and it feels like something is about to burst out of my chest, says Jimmy Matzinger. I'm 25 and I'm still in the same place I was when I earned minimum wage. Four days a week she works at a dental office, Friday she nannies, and weekends she babysits, and still she couldn't keep up with her rent. 
car lease, and student loans. Earlier this year, she had to borrow money to file for bankruptcy. I heard the same walls closing in and anxiety from millennials around the country and across the income scale, from cashiers in Detroit to nurses in Seattle. It's tempting to look at the recession as the cause of all this, the great fuckening from which we are still waiting to recover. But what we are living through now and what the recession merely accelerated is a historic convergence of economic maladies, many of them decades in the making. Decision by decision, the economy has turned into a young people screwing machine. And unless something changes, our calamity is going to become America's. Understanding structural disadvantage is pretty complicated. You'll need a guide. Chapter 1. Never Ending Job Insecurity What Scott remembers are the group interviews. Eight, ten people in suits, a circle of folding chairs, a chirpy HR rep with a clipboard. Each applicant telling her, one by one, in front of all the other, why he's the right candidate for this $11 an hour job as a bank teller. It was 2010. Scott had just graduated from college with a bachelor's in economics, a minor in business, and $30,000 in student debt. At some of the interviews, he was by far the least qualified person in the room. The other applicants described their corporate jobs, listed off graduate degrees. Some looked like they were in their 50s. One time, the HR rep told us she did these three times a week, Scott says, and I just knew I was never going to get a job. After six months of applying an interview and never hearing back, Scott returned to his high school job at the old spaghetti factory. After that, he bounced around, selling suits at Nordstrom Outlet, cleaning carpets, waiting tables, until he learned that city bus drivers earn $22 an hour and get full benefits. He's been doing that for a year now. It's the most money he's ever made. He still lives at home, chipping in a few hundred bucks every month to help his mom pay the rent. In theory, Scott could apply for banking jobs again, but his degree is almost eight years old and he has no relevant experience. He sometimes considers getting a master's, but that would mean walking away from his salary and benefits for two years and taking on another five digits of debt just to snag an entry level position at the age of 30 that would pay less than he makes driving a bus. At his current job, he'll be able to move out in six months and pay off his student loans in 20 years. There are millions of Scots in the modern economy. A lot of workers were just 18 at the wrong time, says William Spriggs, an economics professor at Howard University and assistant secretary for policy at the Department of Labor and the Obama administration. Employers didn't say, oops, we missed a generation. In 2008, we weren't hiring graduates. Let's hire all the people we passed over. No, they hired the class of 2012. You can see this in the statistics, a divot from 2008 to 2012, where millions of jobs and billions in earnings should be. In 2007, more than 50% of college graduates had a job offer lined up. For the class of 2009, fewer than 20% of them did. According to a 2010 study, every 1% uptick in the unemployment rate the year you graduate college means a 6 to 8% drop in your starting salary a disadvantage that can linger for decades. The same study found that workers who graduated during the 1981 recession were still making less than their counterparts who graduated 10 years earlier. Every recession, Spriggs says, creates these cohorts that never recover. In sum, nearly every path to a stable income now demands tens of thousands of dollars before you ever get your first paycheck or have any idea whether you've chosen the right career path. I was literally paying to work, says Elena, a 29 year old dietitian in Texas. I've changed the names of some of these people in this story because they don't want to get fired. 
As part of her master's degree, she was required to do a year-long internship in a hospital. It was supposed to be training, but she says she worked the same hours and did the same task as paid staffers. I took out an extra 20000 in student loans to pay tuition for the year I was working for free, she says. All of these trends, the cost of education, the rise of contracting, the barriers to skilled occupations, add up to an economy that has deliberately shifted the risk of economic recession and industry disruption away from companies and on to individuals. For our parents, a job was a guarantee of a secure adulthood. For us, it's a gamble. And if we suffer a setback along the way, there's so little to keep us from sliding into disaster. Chapter 2 they broke the safety net. Becoming poor is not an event. It's a process. Like a plane crash, poverty is rarely caused by one thing going wrong. Usually, it is a series of misfortunes. A job loss, then a car accident, then an eviction. They interact. They compound. I heard the most accurate description of how this happens from Mr. Krishna, a Duke University professor who has, over the last 15 years, interviewed more than 1,000 people who fell into poverty and escaped it. He started in India and Kenya, but eventually his grad students talked him in doing the same in North Carolina. The mechanism he discovered was the same. We often think of poverty in America as a pool, a fixed portion of the population that remains destitute for years. In fact, Krishna says, poverty is more like a lake with streams flowing steadily in and out all the time. The number of people in danger of becoming poor is far larger than the number of people who are actually poor, he says. We're all living in a state of permanent volatility. Between 1970 and 2002, the probability that a working age American would unexpectedly lose at least half her family income more than doubled. And the danger is particularly severe for young people. In the 1970s, when the boomers were our age, young workers had a 24% chance of falling below the poverty line. By the 1990s, that had risen to 37%. And the numbers only seem to be getting worse. From 1979 to 2014, the poverty rate among young workers with a high school diploma more than tripled to 22%. Millennials feel like they can lose everything at any time, Hacker says, and increasingly, they can. Here's what that downward slide looks like. Gabriel's 19 years old and lives in a small town in Oregon, plays the piano, and until recently was saving up to study music at an arts college. Last summer, he was working at a health supplement company. It wasn't the most glamorous job, lugging boxes and blending ingredients, but he made $12.50 an hour and he hoped he could step up to a better position if he proved himself. Then, his sister got into a car accident. T-bone, turning into their driveway. She couldn't walk, she couldn't think, Gabriel says. His mom wasn't able to take a day off without risking losing her job. So Gabriel called his boss and left a message saying he had to miss work for a day to get his sister home from the hospital. The next day, his temp agency called. He was fired. Though Gabriel says no one had told him, the company had a three strikes policy for unplanned absences. He had already missed one day for a cold and another for a staph infection, so this was it. A former colleague told him that his absences meant he was unlikely to get a job there again. So now, Gabriel works at Taco Time and lives in a trailer with his mom and his sisters. Most of his paycheck goes to gas and groceries because his mom's income is disappearing into the family's medical bills. He still wants to go to college, but since he can barely keep his head above water, he set his sights on an electrician's apprenticeship, program offered by a local nonprofit. I don't understand why it's so hard to do something with your life, he tells me. The answer is brutally simple. In an economy where wages are precarious and the safety net has been hacked into ribbons, one piece of bad luck can easily become a years-long struggle 
to get back to normal. Chapter 3. Rest in peace. Your chances of affording a home. Which prompts the question, how did housing in America become so freaking expensive? Here's your city. Here's downtown. That's where lots of the good jobs are. Most people want to live fewer than 30 minutes from work. So for much of the 20th century, big cities built housing close to jobs. When the inner ring of suburbs filled up, cities built freeways to whisk workers to the next. But then those suburbs filled up, traffic got worse, 30 minute commutes became 45 minute commutes. Demand for houses close to downtown exploded. Here's a simple fix for this problem. Build more housing close to jobs. For a long time, that's exactly what cities did. They built upward, divided homes and apartments and added duplexes and townhomes. But in the 1970s, they stopped building. Cities kept adding jobs and people, but they didn't add more housing. And that's when prices started to climb. So much of this can be explained by one word, zoning. At first, zoning was pretty modest. The point was to stop someone from buying your neighbor's house and turning it into an oil refinery. But eventually, people realized they could use zoning for other purposes. In the late 1960s, it finally became illegal to deny housing to minorities. So cities instituted weirdly specific rules that drove up the price of new houses and excluded poor people who were disproportionately minorities. Houses had to have massive backyards. They couldn't be split into separate apartments. Basically, cities mandated McMansions. We're still living with that legacy across huge swaths of American cities. It's pretty much illegal to build affordable housing. And this problem is only getting worse. That's because all the urgency to build comes from people who need somewhere to live. But all the political power is held by people who already own homes. For homeowners, there's no such thing as a housing crisis. Why? Because when property values go up, so does their net worth. They have every reason to block new construction. And they do that by weaponizing environmental regulations, historical preservation rules. They force buildings to be shorter so they don't cast shadows. They demand two parking spaces for every single unit. They complain that a new apartment building will destroy neighborhood character when the structure it's replacing is a parking garage. True story. All this extra hassle means construction takes longer and costs more. Which means that the only way most developers can make a profit is to build luxury condos. So that's why cities are so unaffordable. The entire system is structured to produce expensive housing when we desperately need the opposite. Millennials who are able to relocate to these oases of opportunities get to enjoy their many advantages. Better schools, more generous social services, more rungs on the career ladder to grab onto. Millennials who can't afford to relocate to a big expensive city are stuck. In 2016, the Census Bureau reported that young people were less likely to have lived at a different address a year earlier than at any time since 1963. And so the real reason millennials can't seem to achieve the adulthood our parents envisioned for us is that we're trying to succeed within a system that no longer makes any sense. Home ownership and migration have been pitched to us as gateways to prosperity 
because back when the boomers grew up, they were. But now the rules have changed and we're left playing a game that is impossible to win. We start earning less money later. We have more debt and higher rent, which means we aren't able to save, which means we can't buy a house or prepare for retirement, which means that unless something changes, all of us are headed for a very dark place.